audio recording of lecture eight, negative RNA virus. The title of this lecture is replication of negative sense RNA viruses multipartite. At the bottom of this slide, I have included a definition of multipartite viruses. These are basically those viruses that their nucleic acid genome is segmented. Uh, this confers some advantage to the virus whereby multiple messenger RNAs are being produced and this will alleviate or circumvent the cellular constraints of monocystinosity. Slide number two. Negative RNA viruses, those that have multi-partite or multiple partitions to their genome, they include the family of orthomyxoviridae. They have eight gene segments, their nucleic, nucleic acid or genome. Bunia viridae, their genome has three gene segments, L, M, S gene segments, and some of the S gene segments are MB sense, as well as arena viridae, that their genome has two segments, L segment, S segment, and both are MB sense. So now the question is, what is MB sense? I have provided a little bit of a description of uh, MB uh, sense on slide number three, which basically states that a single-stranded genome that encompasses both negative sense and positive sense on the same strand is called ambisense. So if you have a segment of the gene that part of it is negative sense, part of it is positive sense, it's called ambisense genome. I would recommend students to refer to this slide for more information about ambisense. Slide number four, the family of orthomyxoviridate, orthonormal myxomucus. These are negative RNA genome viruses and they are enveloped where on the surface of the envelope, they have two specific types of glycoproteins. These are called heme agglutinin or HA, as well as neuraminidase or NA. They also have matrix proteins, M1 and M2, that these are trans membrane proteins, meaning that they can pass through the membrane. And they have a helical capsid that encompasses or protects a ribonucleoprotein or RNP. As we discussed before, RNP is a combination of the nucleic acid and some proteins. And this instance, orthomyxoviridae family of viruses, their genome has eight segments, so multipartite. A famous genus within the family of orthomyxoviridae is the genus of influenza virus, influenza, influence, malign, and supernatural. They have, there are enveloped viruses. They have glycoproteins on their surface. The two types, HA and NA. I want you to appreciate that we have 16 different serotypes or 16 different strains of HA and nine different strains of NA and uh, uh, 
combination of various HA and NAs results in different types of influenza viruses. And based on these, uh, uh, the nucleoproteins, as well as the capsid glycoproteins, the viruses are being divided into three groups. These are all human viruses, type A, type B, and type C. Type A infects humans and animals and usually causes epidemics. And type B infects only humans and also causes epidemics, whereas type C in infects humans, but only causes a mild disease. So the classification of human influenza virus is described on slide number six, is based on HA, various serotypes of HA, NA, neuraminidase, whether they're type A or type B, remember both cause epidemics, type A humans and other animals and type B only humans, based on the geographic source where the virus was identified first, the number of cases that were isolated and lastly, based on the year that the virus was isolated. So slide number seven shows that WHO or World Health Organization uh, influenza nomenclature. And I just uh, need to remind you that uh, it's one of three strains in 2009 vaccine. And basically, as we just mentioned in previous slide is based on the hemagglutinin subtype, followed by neuraminidase subtype, type of influenza, type A, B, C, whatever it is, the geographic location that the virus was first identified, followed by the number of isolates, and lastly, the year that this particular virus was isolated. So let's start talking a little bit about the influenza genome. As mentioned before, it's a negative RNA genome, multipartite. So it has eight gene segments that vary in size from 2.3 kilobases all the way down to 0.9, less, slightly less than one kilobase. And the total genome is relatively large, 13.6 kilobase. And each gene segment, these eight, will transcribe for one messenger RNA. So hypothetically, we have eight messenger RNAs through one through eight. However, the two smallest mRNA segments that are segments number seven and number eight undergo alternative splicing and result uh, in a total of 10 messenger RNAs being transcribed. And the replication events of influenza virus occur in host cell nucleus, as well as cytoplasm. Slide number nine is a depiction of various RNA segments being produced, the lengths of these messenger RNAs based on nucleotide, what about the proteins that they produce, how long the proteins are, what's the length based on the number of amino acids in their composition. And lastly, we have the function of these proteins. As you can appreciate the smallest fragments, seven and eight that are a little bit over a thousand kilo, one KB and below one KB, they undergo alternative splicing and they make 
two mRNAs that they code for two proteins uh, with different sizes and different functions. Slide number 10, the entry and uncoding of influenza virus. Influenza virus enters host cell through receptor mediated endocytosis, meaning that there are specific receptors that uh, interact with specific ligands on the surface of the uh, virus. And then there would be endosome, they get in, uh, pH will change. This will result in the release of eight separate ribonucleoproteins into the host cell cytoplasm. These ribonucleoproteins or RNPs will be transported into the host cell through the pores located on the nuclear membrane or nuclear envelope, just a uh, nuclear pores. Once they get in their transcription of viral RNAs, occur in the host cell nucleus. And I want you to appreciate that viral RNA transcription, which again occurs in host cell nucleus, requires host cell machinery for RNA synthesis. <clears throat> Slide number 11, the translation of uh, messenger RNAs or the production of proteins. Remember, we said that initially there are 10 mRNAs, 8 mRNAs, 2 of them, 7 and 8 undergo alternative splicing. So we end up with a total of 10 viral mRNAs. They all have 7 prime cap and 3 prime poly A tail, and they will shuttle back from the nucleus into the host cell cytoplasm where they use the host cell ribosome located on the rough endoplasmic reticulum to make 10 viral proteins. So let's uh, go a little bit into the details of this uh, influenza virus mRNA transcription complex. <clears throat> so as we said over and over again, the viral genome is negative sense, single-stranded RNA multipartite. And it has three proteins that associate with the viral polymerase. Polymerase is the enzyme that adds nucleotides, pol polymerizes. So there are three polymerase associated proteins. These are called PA, PB1, PB2. These three form a complex, as you can see here. And there is a very interesting and unique process happening here called cap snatching where those enzymes that virus bring in with itself uh, some of them are endonucleases these are enzymes that can cleave or chop off nucleic acids so viral enzymes from the five prime end of the viral of the host cell uh, mRNA, they will cleave off or chop off a small uh, number of nucleotides, or uh, somewhere between ten to thirteen bases. And these 10, uh, 12, 13 base nucleotide sequence serves as primer for viral mRNA transcription, and initially transcribes eight mRNAs. Let's repeat it one more time. There are three proteins, PA, PB1, PB2, 
that are polymerase associated proteins. They form complexes and associate with the viral polymerases. As part of the enzymes that virus brings in with itself are endonuclease enzymes, enzyme that is capable of cleaving nucleic acid. And there is a process called cap snatching. Cap, referring to the five prime cap of host cell mRNA and snatching is just basically cleaves off 12, 13 uh, nucleotides from the five prime, uh, five prime end of host cell messenger RNA, this small piece of nucleotide will serve, coming from host cell, will serve as a primer, so it would allow viral mRNA transcription to be completed, resulting in the production of eight mRNAs. And as I mentioned before, seven and eight messenger RNAs number seven and eight will undergo alternative splicing or differential splicing, uh, which I'm sure that everybody has heard of it before during previous classes, but just to make sure that you guys are up to speed, I have included uh, a definition here for you, which I strongly recommend students to look at. It. Okay. So let's talk about this whole process. Uh, I'm sure by now everybody's an expert in RI1, RI2. It's a single stranded genome, doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. In two intermediary stages or steps, it needs to make a complementary strand and more of whatever the genome is. So during the first step, this negative RNA uh, genome will serve as template, we make anti-genome. So as you know, the anti-genome in this instance is a positive strand. And we have negative and positive. Positive serves as messenger RNA. So we start synthesizing viral proteins in the cytoplasm, nucleoproteins, those uh, polymerase associated proteins and then they will transport into nucleus for RNA transcription. And once we have enough levels of the NP protein, nuclear protein, it switches the transcription to uncapped positive RNA antigenome. So, what will happen during this second phase? The second phase, the positive RNA antigenome that is being made during the first step, it's a full length positive genome, will serve as a template for the production of more negative genomic RNA. This negative RNA genome will be used again, to transcribe more mRNAs. So it needs to go through RI1 again. And also, since it matches the, G, the, G, the original uh, directions and sense of the genome, it serves as the uh, genome for the new progeny viruses or virions. Ribonucleoproteins are being assembled in the nucleus. These are RNA genome, NP, and those three uh, polymerase-associated proteins. These ribonucleoproteins will uh, be transported back from the nucleus into the cytoplasm by viral M1 or matrix protein, as well as another protein called NS2 or non-structural protein number two. Uh, for those of you who may have forgotten about what is a nucleoprotein, I have provided explanation and definitions of both deoxyribonucleoprotein or DNP as well as ribonucleoprotein or 
RNP. And at the bottom of this slide, I have provided a little bit of an information about chromatin nucleases as well as antigenic determinants. Slide number 19, via influenza virus assembly and release hemagglutinin, neuraminidase, and M2 matrix protein 2. These will these are proteins that after uh, production, they undergo post-translational modification, meaning that in the endoplasmic reticulum or Golgi, they become glycosylated. A sugar moiety will be added to them. These glycosylated proteins, viral proteins, will be inserted into the host cell plasma membrane specific region of host cell plasma membrane. Viral ribonucleoprotein associates with matrix protein one, which guides the uh, virus to go into the, uh, that the region of the host cell plasma membrane that has been modified uh, via insertion of HANA and M2 viral proteins. So M1 associates with ribonucleoproteins and guides the virus to go to the region that has been modified by the uh, viral proteins. And virus exits the host cell through budding in the process, it will pick up a piece of the host cell plasma membrane. So this uh, also during budding, uh, M2 transmembrane pr protein also helps the virus to get out of the cell. Slide number 20 talks about virus respiratory infections, the infections in the respiratory tract, caused by influenza virus. Initially, the primary site that the virus causes infection are the oral cavity or buccal cavity and the respiratory mucosa, nasal cavity, pharynx, and a little bit of the, nas uh, of the respiratory mucosa. Sometimes the eyes are involved and sometimes they are not. From these primary sites or primary organs, the virus migrates to lymphatic tissues or lymph nodes. And from lymph nodes, it enters blood. So we have viremia. At this stage, patients uh, exhibit fever, they're feverish, and they have malice, or they're just tired, or so to speak, they're just out of it. Some people say, uh, uh, use the expression, I was hit by, the, by a truck. The secondary site of influenza virus uh, infection are basically the organs of reticular endothelial system. These include liver, spleen, bone marrow, or BM. From the secondary organs, virus re-enters blood. So we have secondary viremia. And from blood, it can travel to infect other target organs these include extremities, skin, respiratory tract, gastrointestinal tract, central nervous system, and heart. So let's take a closer look at the influenza infection or the disease itself. What's the process of viral causing the disease or so to speak, pathogenesis of influenza virus. virus. Viral replication occurs in the upper respiratory tract. How does it work? 
neuraminidase breaks up neuraminic acid in mucin barriers. We have mucus in the respir uh, upper respiratory tract. Uh, and a component of uh, the mucus is neuraminic acid, which provides a tight uh, barrier. And viral neuraminidase breaks this barrier. And hemagglutinin will come and attaches to neuraminic acid. Therefore, it penetrates into the mucosal membrane. As a result, host defense, two major types of host defense are being compromised. One is uh, the destruction of mucociliary defense. We talked about how mucous membrane uh, is being uh, jeopardized and invaded. And then the cilia or those little teeny tiny protrusions cannot do their job and push the virus, bacteria or foreign objects out. The second uh, damaging effect of the virus is macrophages and the functionality of T cells will be impaired. So macrophages cannot engulf the virus and T cells cannot uh, uh, get rid of or engulf virally infected cells. This will result in virus, influenza virus, so to speak, setting up shop, and that will pave the way for additional viral infections and or secondary bacterial infections. Since it's in the respiratory system, the bacterial infection is pneumonia and the causative bacterial causative agents are staphylococcus group, streptococcus, and hemophilus. These three classes or these three groups of bacteria can cause secondary bacterial pneumonia subsequent to a successful influenza virus infection of the host cell respiratory tract. Slide number 22 on the far left column talks, uh, shows a number of uh, symptoms, fever, headache, general muscle aches and pain, sore throat, etc. And then the following two columns are basically a comparison between two different viral infections that more or less exhibit these symptoms. These two viral infections are cold as well as flu. And some people uh, uh, get these two diseases confused. For example, for cold, there is no prevention, but for flu, we receive annual vaccination, antiviral drugs, et cetera. Slide number 23 talks about <clears throat> epidemiology of influenza virus. Influenza virus is capable of causing endemics, usually during winters, and the peak, it peaks in December to January. It can cause epidemics every about five years or so, and it can cause pandemics. And uh, here we have a list of some of the pandemics that have happened in the past. And uh, as you can see, different strains of virus, H1N1 or H2N2 or H3N2 have caused different uh, pandemics. It's interesting because H1N1 caused uh, pandemics in 1918, the Spanish pandemic, which claimed more than 20 million deaths, and the same strain of virus about 59 years later in 1977, uh, the Russian pandemic uh, was caused by the same strain of virus or the same, so to speak, serotype of the virus. And in the United States of America, uh, epidemiologists estimate that each year, 10 to 20% of the population get flu, over 10,000 hospitalizations for flu-related com complications, 
sometimes there are large number of deaths, mortality rates up to 40,000 uh, patients, not because of the flu, but because of the complications of the flu. Let's move on to, to talk a little bit about uh, the rapid laboratory tests used for the detection of influenza virus A and B. Uh, you should know that there are numerous commercial kits available now, and the sample is pretty much the same sample that people use for coronavirus detection. It's called NP swab or nasopharyngeal swab, that this includes mucus as well as some cells that are perhaps virally infected cells, so virus is in there. And uh, uh, they use an assay called immunochromatographic membrane assay. So it's done on a membrane, as you can see on the left-hand side figure. And it is a combination of immunological techniques as well as chromatographic techniques. So this assay uses a technology called ELISA or enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay where we have very specific monoclonal antibodies to, uh, to influenza virus A and B nucleoproteins. They are very specific. And you just basically test the reagents and pads in a test strip that is mounted inside a cardboard device. It's a very easy one-step test. You just add the sample to top of the test strips. They have all these antibodies embedded in them and just close it, give it some time for specific and very sensitive interaction between the antigen and antibody. The antibody is there if the uh, virally infected cells contain the virus and the virus has specific antigens, it will interact with the antibodies. And we just, uh, the detection is based on the presence or absence of a pink strip. Uh, the specificity of the assay is very high. However, the sensitivity is a lot lower than the shell vial culture technique. Slide number 25, we have influenza vi virus A epidemics. We talked about it. Uh, and these epidemics are usually due to the ability of the virus to change itself. So it can go undetected by the immune system, or so to speak, it can uh, evade an effective immune response. So if the immune system cannot recognize a virus, it cannot trigger or mount an effective immune response of so the virus goes undetected and it can expand uh, or replicate and cause the disease. These changes are due to two processes. One is called antigenic drift. And this drift is a gradual variation of hemagglutinin and neuraminidase antigenic determinants of the virus due to the high RNA mutation rate. So because of the mutation, the composition of these will be changed and over time the immune system cannot recognize it. So they are capable of infecting more and more patients. The other process is called antigenic shift, which is more dramatic because it's major variations in the genome, it is, uh, it causes dual infections and plus gene reassortment. We'll talk about this 
in a little bit more detail in subsequent slide, uh, but know that, uh, for example, the origin of influenza A virus uh, was at one point due to exchange between different animals, so-called dual infection. It could infect avians, and then it also could infect pigs, so there would be a lot larger reservoir in the nature of it, and each one of these could infect humans. So slide number 26 is a depiction of an antigenic drift on the left-hand side, an antigenic shift on the right-hand side, both result in the appearance or development of viruses that were previously unknown to the immune system. So let's see what will happen if uh, a, a host of a virus is being infected by a virus that comes from an animal and a virus that comes, let's say from human, a human influenza virus and uh, a second virus from a, another species, such as another animal, these two, when they co-infect a host, in, once they are going through the process of receptor-mediated endocytosis and uncoding uh, in the cytoplasm before getting into the nucleus, all these gene segments are floating around. And once they, the virus is being replicated, we make a lot more of first virus, a lot more of the second virus, and sometimes due to these uh, recombination events, as well as the high mutation rate in the RNA polymerase, we get these viruses that is partly from virus number one, partly from number virus number two, so it cannot be recognized by the host immune system. Another example of antigenic change that happens over time and was the result of various pandemics throughout the history, 1918, 57, 68, and 77. These are due to shifts or drastic changes in these uh, a viral antigenic determinant such as heme agglutinin or HA and nur aminidase or NA. As you can see, anytime there is a significant shift or change from the, the original uh, strain, you will see an epidemic. So remember that shift is major changes and drift is slight or gradual changes. Okay, so as we mentioned before, the, there were uh, pandemics of this virus and people should be, in my opinion, should be very, very concerned about, be uh, on the alert, if you wish. Uh, for example, in 97, there was a pandemic of a strain of influenza called H5N1. So it's basically, it was bird flu. And in 2001, we had swine flu, uh, but with a different strain of the virus. So perhaps this has undergone antigenic changes uh, in the HA or uh, hemagglutinin an antigenic determinant, which was sufficient enough to cause another pandemic. Treatment of influenza. We have several different types of treatments. First type of treatment are antiviral drugs, such as remantidine for flu A or Tamiflu and Relenza for both flu A and flu B. Uh, I should just uh, remind you that these need to be administered within the first 48 hours, otherwise the virus uh, will get into the cell and uh, it, it would be harder to treat. 
The second class of treatment is inactivated killed whole virus or subunits of the virus such as HA and NA in the form of vaccination. These vaccines can be administered specifically to elderly uh, individuals and uh, people who are residents of nursing homes, patients who have chronic diseases, healthcare workers, or basically anybody who desires to have protection against influenza virus. Another type of uh, treatment is live cold adopted virus vaccine. Uh, this, this, uh, this virus vaccine is given as a nasal spray and it uh, can be used in a very wide host uh, patient range uh, or susceptible group range aging from five to 50 years of age. However, you, uh, you need to be very careful that in children, uh, uh, usually the disease is accompanied by fever. So uh, these patients should not be given aspirin because if you give it, uh, if you give aspirin to treat fever because of viral infection, it's basically uh, contradictory and it causes Reyes syndrome in the children, which is injury to the liver and encephalopathy. And below I've provided a little bit of an explanation of what contradiction is. So let's take a quick look at slide number 29, how to make a flu vaccine. Remember that influenza has eight gene segments. So what we are interested in are those gene segments that are disease causing agents uh, or uh, immune eliciting uh, uh, antigenic determinants. These are HA and NA. We get piece uh, the, the gene encoding for these two and put them into DNA loops or plasmid vectors. At the same time, from another mm -hmm. virus, we get the other six uh, uh, gene segments, proteins encoded by the other six gene segments. These include uh, those three polymerase associated protein, nuclear proteins, matrix protein and non-structural proteins. And then we put those gene segments encoded in red in this picture. We put them in DNA, so to speak, DNA loops or plasmids. And then we infect a monolayer of animal cells where the virus can go in, penetrate and make a, a, a new strain or so-called a seed virus where it has the antigenic determinants from a dangerous uh, virus such as an avian flu virus and the proteins from another virus. So they will recombine, we make seed virus, then we inject it into chicken eggs, then we will end up with a new flu strain that can serve as vaccine because the antigenic determinants are from avian, the rest are from human. So we inject this new strain as a vaccine into human beings and it just basically creates a lot of antibodies or immunoglobulins in the host cell. And uh, these uh, antibodies can recognize and neutralize the hemagglutinin or neuraminidase genes, uh, gene uh, proteins resulting from those genes, hence uh, neutralizing the virus. So there are like any other virus, there are risks and benefits associated with flu vaccines. Slide number 30, compares and contrasts. 
these uh, two. Uh, so first of all, you, as we know, there are over a million flu infections per year in the United States, over 100,000 hospitalizations, anywhere between 20 to 40,000 deaths per year due to the complications caused by flu virus infection. So <clears throat> this highlights that, oh, okay, it's a good idea to get the vaccine. But remember that like any other vaccine, flu vaccines have some potential side effects uh, and these potential side effects or pros and cons or what. First off, it's a killed inactivated virus. Therefore, you will not get flu uh, when you receive the vaccine. However, it causes a little bit of a soreness, redness and swelling at the injection site. It also causes a low grade fever because it comes into the body, body recognizes it as foreign prostaglandins are being released. Immune cells are being recruited to the site of infection. So these will cause a little bit of a fever, some ache, and in rare instances, there are rare yet very serious problems. And most of these problems ar arise from the fact that individuals develop an allergic reaction to the proteins that are found in the uh, chicken egg. Okay, so, the title of this slide is Don't Blame Flu Shots for All Ills as Officials, say Dr. Harvey Feinberg, President of Institute of Medicine in 2009, said this quote. And uh, it just basically points to the fact that, yes, there are some side effects, but everything else has side effects also. For example, each year, there are over 1 million heart attacks, uh, about 800,000 strokes, eight, uh, over 800,000 miscarriages, and about 200 individuals have their first seizure. So it's, he was just basically defending the use of vaccine and saying, oh, it's not as bad as you think because we have a lot other stuff going on too. Okay, so... <clears throat> Slide number 32 uh, is a depiction of similar negative RNA virus genomes. We have seen this slide before. And on the top, they're talking about Raptoviridae and Paramyxoviridae family of RNA negative viruses that are non-segmented or one single segment or monopartate. And at the bottom of the slide, we see Bunia viridae, Arena viridae, Orthomyxo viridae, that their genome is negative sense RNA, yet multipartite, meaning that they have multiple gene segments. For example, Bunia viridae, we have this, we have this gene segment, and uh, this gene segment. Okay, so far, the Influenza virus lecture summary, genome is eight negative RNA segments, viral mRNA transcription, and alternative splicing occurs in host cell nucleus. Influenza virus uh, can cause very serious recurring pandemics around the globe that these pandemic diseases are associated with high morbidity and mortality rates. They kill a lot of people. These new strains that cause pandemics arise due to the virus's ability to change its antigenic determinants by gradual changes or small mutations that lead to antigenic drift. This is due to RNA polymerase mutation rate and by gene reassortment or antigenic shift where the changes are more drastic and uh, 
more pronounced. The reading for these uh, uh, lecture slides, uh, the associated reading from the textbook are in chapter 15, replication strategies of RNA viruses requiring RNA directed mRNA transcription as the first step in viral expression. Okay, let's continue by the next family, the family of Bunia viridae. These are native RNA, enveloped. They have three helical circular nucleocapsids and the genome is three segments. Most of Bunia viridae families are arboviruses, meaning that they infect arthropods, birds and mammals. Bunia viridae gene segments are called LMS. L codes for polymerase gene or RNA polymerase. M codes for G1 and G2, that these are those glycoproteins that go into the uh, uh, envelope eventually. And a non-structural protein that comes from the M gene segment. Then we have a third segment, S segment, ribonucleoprotein gene that these code for nucleocapsid and some non-structural proteins that come from the S gene segment, hence NSS, and some of these NSSs are ambisens. These three gene segments combined make the negative RNA genome and it's 13 to 21 kilobases, so relatively large. A genus within the Bunia viridae family is genus Hanta virus. These are rodent born viruses and transmission of the Hanta virus genus is by contact with body fluids such as saliva or excretions of the animal such as urine and feces via aerosols. You don't even need to touch urine or feces via the aerosols. Two prime examples of the viruses within the Hanta virus genus are Hantan virus that was found in Korea caused hemorrhagic fever plus renal syndrome and Sin nombre virus that was found in the Southwest United States of America, and it causes a disease called heart or Hanta virus, adult respiratory distress syndrome. The next genus within the Bunia viridae family is the genus of Orthobunia virus, Orthobunia virus requires a mosquito as a vector. They usually are asymptomatic diseases. Sometimes we see some fever, rash, and encephalitis. Three examples of Orthobunia viruses are Bunium Wera virus found in Africa, California encephalitis virus in the United States, as well as the La Cross Encephalitis virus also found in the United States. The next genus is called Flebo virus, Flebo, phlebotomy, something has to do with the veins. And these are also arthropod borne viruses. The specific vector is called sand fly. There are two prime examples of flaboviruses. These are sand fly fever virus, as well as rift valley fever virus found in Africa. And the, the diseases caused by these viruses are often 
fatal hemorrhagic fever. They have high fever and they bleed to death. Okay, so this is a very interesting uh, concept that we will discuss here and that is the mRNA transcription of the S gene segment of Bunia Verde. Remember we said, we said that Bunia Verde has three gene segments. One of them is S. So how the mRNA is being transcribed. So first off, you need to note that the viral replication happens inside of the host cell cytoplasm. And it transcribes one or two mRNAs from the same gene. Definitely N and sometimes NS, non-structural that comes from the S gene segment. The messenger RNAs that are being produced for these two have has five prime seven methyl guanine cap, but at the three prime end, we do not see a poly A tail. So there are three different strategies when uh, how we can code for these two gene segments, N and NSS. The first strategy is that plain and simple, we do not make any NS, we only have N. The second strategy is that these two gene segments, N and NSS, have overlapping ORF or open reading frames. So once one is being transcribed, the second one will be transcribed along with it. And the third strategy is the ambisense genome, meaning that this particular gene segment may have both negative and positive strands within it. So let's see what's going on. The first, as I mentioned, the very first coding strategy from S gene that is seen in Hanta virus is no NS production. So basically the virus transcribes one single messenger RNA that codes for the N protein, plain and simple. It does not code for NSS protein, a non-structural protein that comes from the S gene segment. Plain and simple, good. Okay, what about the second coding strategy? We see that in Bunia virus that employs an over, overlapping open reading frame strategy. So basically we have two partially overlapping open reading frames where NSS uh, far right, NSS is within the N open reading frame. So what will happen is it translate, transcribes for one single messenger RNA. And from this one single messenger RNA, both N as well as NS proteins are being translated by a process called alternative reading frame of mRNA. So there are two reading frames on the mRNA. And once the ribosomes recognizes that two proteins are being made. Okay. So the last strategy that is seen in flebovirus is the ambisense genome strategy, where one gene segment, if this entire uh, picture shows the, this diagram shows the genome, five prime end, three prime end. So this S gene, the genomic RNA, has two open reading frames. One is NSS, the other one is N. And these are oriented in opposite directions where N is negative or negative sense 
and NSS is the positive sense. So as we mentioned before, if you have a piece of genome that has negative and positive uh, strands in it, that's called ambisense. So this is the ambisense strategy used in flebovirus. So the S genomic mRNA cannot serve as mRNA because it's a negative RNA. And it also lacks five prime cap recognition for ribosomes. So ribosomes cannot recognize it, cannot translate it, but it transcribes two subgenomic messenger RNAs, one for NSS, the other one for N. Let's see what will happen. I want you guys to pay very close attention to this relatively simple, straightforward process, but since you may have not seen it before, it may sound a little difficult for you. Let's start with the uh, N gene segment. It's a negative strand. The negative strand undergoes RI1 to make a positive strand. And since positive strand, as we've mentioned before, can serve as messenger RNA, it translates the N protein. So that's the N part of it. And what about the NSS part of it? The NSS part of it, uh, the, this will be transcribed to make a messenger RNA that has a cap. If it has a cap, it can be recognized by the ribosomes. So it will be translated to NSS protein. So N subgenomic mRNA and eventually N protein. The N mRNA comes from the three prime end of the genome. This will, uh, this N transcribes to a messenger RNA, five prime to three prime, the opposite direction of it. And it is, since it's positive strand and mRNA can translate for N protein as I just mentioned. And the NSS gene segment, the messenger RNA from anti-genome of the three prime N, because if here you have the N, Initially it was three prime N, now it's five prime. So five prime to three prime, NSS would be here. It transcribes a messenger RNA. This is three prime, messenger RNA five prime, where we have the cap and this direction. So the two mRNAs are on opposite directions. And this will translate for the NSS. So again, since this is a negative strand, it goes through RI1 and then RI2. RI1 makes positive, RI2 makes more negative. So we not only have more of the negative and positive strands at the end, but we also translate for negative, for N protein as well as the NSS protein. Okay, slide number 49 is just basically the ambisense strategy uh, that is being used by arena viruses as well as flebovirus. As we discussed, one gene segment is negative, the other one is positive. Positive can serve as messenger RNA, but negative has to go through an intermediary step RI1 to make positive in order to make the protein. And slide number 50 is just basically uh, the same slide that we've seen it a few times so far. These are, uh, this slide has categorized similar negative RNA virus genomes, non-segmented, uh, that the gene has one simple molecule, one single molecule where, uh, or one segment where such as Raptoviridae, Paramyxoviridae, pneumovirus, Paramyxovirus, Lysavirus, Vesicular virus, etc., or they are segmented, even though Buniaviridae family, Arenaviridae, Orthomyxoviridae, they are 
all negative RNA viruses single-stranded. However, their genome is multi-partite and it has multiple gene segments. Examples would be Orthomyxoviridae family, influenza viruses, arena virus, flebovirus, and bunia virus. Okay, summary for bunia viridae family genome is three negative RNA segments L, M, S. The important genuses within this family are hantavirus, orthobunia virus, flebovirus. They use, they either do not make NSS from the S gene segment, or if we want to express NSS gene, uh, NSS protein from S gene segment, we use two different strategies used by different viral uh, viruses. For example, Bunia virus employs the overlapping open reading frame strategy, whereas Flebo virus as well as Arena virus use the ambisense genome strategy. So let's have a few words about the family of Arena viridae, Arena sandy, because we see a lot of ribosomes, non-functional ribosomes in the newly synthesized virions. There are, these family of viruses are negative RNA enveloped and they have two helical circular nucleocapsids anywhere between nine to 15 nanometer, very small. And the natural hosts are rodents. So arena viridae, in the rodents. Transmission, as we mentioned before, by secretions and excreta, such as saliva, urine, via aerosols. That makes it, in my opinion, a little scary, the aerosol part of it. The genus that we talk about is called genus Arena virus. Four important viruses in this genus LCM or lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus causes mild flu in mice and humans. Lassa fever virus, Lassa fever found in Africa. Uh, it causes highly fatal hemorrhagic fever. Uh, it's it resides or, or its host would be rats, house rats. And the very important thing about Lassa fever virus is that it's a biosafety level, level four pathogen or BSL-4. Junin virus was found in Argentine. So it's also referred to as Ar uh, causes Argentine hemorrhagic fever found in field rodents as opposed to house rodents for Lassa virus. And Machupo virus is a causative agent of Bolivian hemorrhagic fever. Arena viruses are negative RNA genome viruses. There are two gene segments that both are ambisense genomes forming a 10 kilobase long genome, negative RNA genome. LCM or lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus within the genus of arena virus uh, causes persistent chronic infections. It can cause infection of rodent host early in their lives and in the hosts, they cause persistent chronic infection. Then they get into the bloodstream, viremia, and virus will be shed in the saliva and urine of the rodents. And 
the problem is that there would be very little or almost no neutralizing antibodies mounted against this virus. But at the same time, it's a very good model to study virus host factors for chronic infections. So if you remember, uh, just remember that it's lympho, uh, lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus that causes chronic infection. The reason for the chronic infection is because there is no antibody to get rid of it. Slide number six, I'm sure you've memorized this slide. I'm perhaps tired of seeing it. Again, it shows uh, similar negative RNA viruses from their genome perspective. Slide number 57, arena virus summary. Genome is composed of two negative RNA segments. Both are ambisense. The virus lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus or LCM, L for lymphocytic, C for choreo, M for meningitis, causes a mild flu-like disease in humans, but it causes a persistent chronic infection in newborn animals or rodents. Loss of fever, we mentioned that it's biased, uh, bio safety level four pathogen, loss of fever, junin, and machupo virus are important causes of hemorrhagic fever in human. The reading material for these slides are in chapter 15 of the textbook, replication strategies of RNA viruses, requiring RNA-directed mRNA transcription as the first step in viral expression. This is the end of lecture eight, negative RNA viruses, multi-party. Thank you very much for your attention.